Okay, so the chief is going to take us through the topic called teaching and assessing compositions. This is a crucial topic for all teachers of English because writing is a serious skill that our learners should attain, especially when they reach grade 12 as they prepare to go into society. And so our chief is going to take us through this crucial topic. Now, while he's presenting, we are going to mute all our microphones so that we only allow the presenter's voice to be heard. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for us to interact with the presenter by way of asking questions or making comments. When that time comes, you'll be asked to unmute yourself and use the raise your hand feature on Zoom. Please, let's comply. Immediately you notice that your mic is on, please mute yourself. And if you do not, we'll be able to mute you from here. Chief, are you ready to take us through? Uh, yes, George, thank you so much, Mr. Kanyama. Uh, good afternoon, is it afternoon or evening? Doc, is it afternoon or evening? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Today we are looking at uh, the teaching of compositions. And basically we are looking at composition writing. What is it that we should teach? And uh, that's what to consider. And also we're going to look at the assessment. How do you assess a piece of writing? So what should we consider when teaching? Basically, um, my presentation will be mainly focusing on the text English composition and summary for school certificate. If you have, you would follow very well this presentation. If you don't have all the same, just uh, be attentive. Like the host said, I'm Lazaro Sinkala. Let's look at Let's look at the compositions. What is it that we should we need to teach? First and foremost, we need to know that there are four types of compositions. There are only four types. We have the narrative, we have descriptive, we have discursive, and we have the expository composition. These are the only four types of compositions that we have. One may ask, what about letter writing? What about article, report? Those are not types. They are rather topics in composition, which can be written from any of the four types that are there. So we'll begin by looking at the narratives. When it comes to narratives, we know that narratives are stories. What should we teach? in order to achieve the objective. We know that a story, uh, the narrative is the uh, composition that tells a story, such as fictional works, novels, short stories. These are examples of narration. Now, with regard to, with regard to narrative, what should we focus on? The first thing that we need to focus on is the interpretation. When you are confronted or when you want to teach narrative, first teach the interpretation of the topic. There are only two types of interpretations. A topic can be interpreted either literally or metaphorically. The literal interpretation is um, when you literally interpret a topic word for word the way it is. For example, the unwelcome 
visitor. If you choose to write, say about two or more people who pay you a visit and stay with you for a few days against the wish of every member of your family, your interpretation of this topic, the unwelcome visitor in this case is literal and it is acceptable. Metaphorical, on the same topic, if you discover, you write a story in which one evening you discover that two venomous snakes have entered your house and then you narrate events leading to you, your sister being injured and the consequent capture of the snake, your interpretation in this case is metaphorical because you've just used the, 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 the topic, the unwelcome visitor and create a story because, I mean, realistically, you cannot refer to a serpent, a snake as a visitor, but you've used the concept of being visited and you come up with a story. That interpretation is called literal, uh, rather metaphorical interpretation. It is also acceptable. However, I must be quick to say, when it comes to metaphorical um, uh, uh, interpretation versus literal interpretation, the proverbs and adages, those do not comply to literal uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, you cannot talk about a proverb literally the way it comes out. Then you are, you are, you are wrong and you get it all wrong. You get zero, no matter how good your linguistic ability may be. The next thing that we need to teach is the point of view with regards to narrative composition. We need to, before we settle our learners into writing, they need to know which point of view are they going to write a story? Which point of view is one going to write a story? In short, who tells the story? Stories can only be written from uh, two points of view, either the first person pronoun or the third person. The first person, I, once upon a time, I went to town. We went to town. Or third person, once upon a time, she went to town. He went to town. They went to town. That is, those are the two points of view. You cannot tell a story, and this our learners need to know. You cannot tell a story from the second uh, person point of view. You cannot say once upon a time, you went to town. That ceases to be a story. So we need to teach them, practice uh, the point of view under which one should start a story. Now, starting and ending, that's another thing that we need to consider. They say uh, the opening sentence is very crucial. The opening sentence must be an eye catcher. An eye catcher is something that captures the reader's interest and fire him or her with a desire to read on. Okay. It must, um, it must be fresh and original. Something that you create there and there. Mind you, we're talking about narrative composition, narrative writing, something that is fresh and original. You avoid trite, insipid sentences. You avoid cliches. Cliches are phrases grammatically correct, but they've been overused with time and they've ceased to be interesting. One of them is the one I'm using, once upon a time. It's no longer interesting to begin a story with once upon a time. Beginning the story by defining the way they opened the window. The cool breeze entered. So many people have started their stories with that. It's no longer interesting. So be original, okay? Be original. How do you end the story? By finding a way of resolving the situation, the conflict in a satisfying or challenging way. Sometimes leaving the reader guessing. That's how you end the story. Some of the examples of well-started, well, -started, well uh, uh, um, uh, sentences, natural. When we look at, look at the third bullet, 
She cried and cried until she died. Now imagine you reading a story. You're tired, you reach home, and you pick this uh, story, and the very first sentence says, she cried and cried until she died. Definitely. That is very original. That is very catchy. It's an eye catcher. It will compel you to read on. The cops winked at me during body viewing. A story begins like that. You definitely be compelled to want to read some more and find out what happened next. They say the ending of one story is the beginning of another. Okay. For example, look at how in Chinua Achebe things fall apart, page 144, how Chinua ended that particular uh, chapter. Said, he wiped his machete on the sand and went away. Imagine that's the end of the story. Imagine how many stories one would write out of that. If we gave this as a beginning of the story to 100 people, 100 various different diversified stories would come out. So we teach step by step these uh, mm, these aspects of narrative composition. Before you move to the next one, you ensure that the learners learn and you drill them to understand that particular aspect so that by the end of it, all the aspects, they are able to write a complete uh, story. The structure, what, what is the structure of, what is the structure of the story? The story should not be confusing, but clear and gripping. One way of making stories interesting, mind you, the epitome of any story is interest, is the use of flashback technique. A flashback is a scene within a story that inter uh, interrupts the sequence of events to relate events that occurred in the past. So this technique, again, let's teach it so that the learners, once they understand it, they'll be including it in their stories. Characterization, I think that one is obvious. Stories are about people, or animals, or things sometimes behaving like real human beings. Characters should be realistic. In a story of an essay type, which is um, between 250. I tried to invite you, we attended and he said it. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Imagine a story, you are asked to write a story between 250 and 350 ways. Not a foot of so many uh, characters because you yourself or the, your readers will get confused. So limit your characters. Let's teach the learners to limit the characters to, the, to suit the number of words that they are using, the, the shortness or length of the story that they are writing. Suspense, one of the ways of making a narrative essay gripping is the use of suspense. Host, what have you done to my videos? Hello, host. Hello, host. Hello. Hello, host. My slides cannot move. Your slide cannot move. Slides are, not, are no longer moving. Uh, I think your laptop might be freezing. Oh. Yes. Can I stop sharing for a while? Uh, yes. Just Post. start afresh. You can start afresh. Okay. Start sharing. So we're talking about suspense. One way, one way of making a story gripping and uh, is the use of suspense. 
Now, suspense is the feeling of tension or anxiety about what may happen. Okay. It is a feeling of anxious uncertainty about the outcome of events in a literary work. So we need to teach our learners the, and let them practice the use of uh, suspense, okay, in order to make an sto a story uh, interesting. Let's look at the example. The example about suspense. In February 1972, Katongo looked for Maria and promised to marry her before he fled to South Africa to work in the gold mines. He was out there for seven long years without any communication at all. As he trudged towards her hut, which had been pointed out by some stranger, Katongo wondered whether she was still single and whether she still loved him. His heartbeat increased a geometric progression. Then he saw her coming out of the hut with a baby strapped onto her back. Instantly, he exuded cold perspiration, which blared his vision. He scurried up to the hut and planted himself just before her. She was rooted to some spot, her mouth agape. He gazed intently into her eyes, a scare. She was still single. She had waited for him. The baby on her back was her sister's. Now, that is a demonstration of suspense. Another thing we need to teach our learners when it comes to narrative composition is the aspect of telling and showing. Telling is not effective in a composition. Sure, do not tell. For example, telling. When you write, while waiting outside her office for her turn to be interviewed, Maria was very, very nervous. That well-constructed sentence is simply telling. It is not showing. It is not showing. Let's look at showing of the same sentence. While waiting outside the office for a tent to be interviewed, Maria stood up from her chair, sat down, stood up again, and walked up and down the corridor, nervously stealing glances at her wristwatch from time to time. She shook violently, and every pore of her skin exuded sweat. You have shot, and I'm sure even as I'm reading, as, even as you read, you are able to see because you've been showed, you, are not, you haven't been taught. So, we also coupled with a structure lesson, the use of direct speech in narratives, okay? So another way of enhancing interest in a story is the use of direct speech to introduce dialogue. Because we're talking about the characters. Remember, we talked about the characters. And characters are, are, are visible. They are human beings. There must be dialogue. There must be a time when these characters are brought to, um, uh, to life. So dialogue can create a sense of time and place. Tell about character and also foreshadow possible trouble. Let's get an excerpt very quickly from the river between Baingugi Wathiongo. Miriam was inside and she too did not speak to Nyambura. Her father followed her in. Where have you been? His voice was menacing. She was afraid of him. Near the river, who was with you? I was alone, father. She was trembling. She had gone to the river hoping that her safety would come in a cloud and rescue her. But Waiyaki had not come. Her obedience to her father had made her lose him. No one? Yes. You are lying. You are lying. I was alone, father, she insisted. Do not think I'm blind. I'm not that old. And now, <laughs> when we look at this dialogue, you don't need to read the entire story to, to realize what is going on there. So Gugi clearly uses this dialogue to stimulate the suspense and the interest in the reader's mind. 
He creates a sense of time and place, makes us figure out the mood in the characters, and also makes the reader move along with the story. Now, we when we teach all these aspects then we have completed the teaching of narrative and we are set with our learners to test them to let them uh, write very good stories because they'll practice all these things because you've taught them time i mean step by step and they should bring out all these in one essay Let's move on to the next type of composition, descriptive. A descriptive composition is one that requires you to describe a place, a person, a scene, or an event. A good descriptive depends on a creation of vivid word pictures. We are talking about creating a picture in the mind of the reader. In order to do that, and in order to teach effectively the, the, the descriptive composition, what should we focus on? First, we need to teach the learners the structure of a description. It must be properly organized. The first approach that we need to teach them is the bottom to up approach. This one is used to describe, for instance, human beings, height, you know, things that are standing like buildings, okay? So if you are to describe a human being, you use this approach, bottom to up approach, or vice versa, up to bottom. If you are describing a human being, you start from the bottom, the legs, you move on to the knees, you move on to the bosom, the, the chest, the shoulders, up to the head. You, you don't um, haphazardly uh, uh, put up um, that description. Far too near used to describe the, the, the places, okay? Uh, bird's eye view. Uh, come repo effect approach is where you place yourself on top and you you describe whatever you see down there. So these are the approaches that we introduce at this level. The next thing we need to introduce as teachers to our learners with regards to descriptive composition is the diction. The choice and use of words is what is called diction. We should remember that the words are your drawing board, your colors, your paint, and your brush. They are all you need to produce a graphic and descriptive composition. In a descriptive piece of writing, a good diction is, is a must. It is also important to use adjectives. Most nouns that are used should be described. Imagine. You, if you simply, you end up telling, if you simply say, I saw a girl and you end there, you have then described the noun girl. You say, I saw a beautiful girl. There'll be no question. I saw a stupid girl. There'll be no question. I saw a tall girl. Those are adjectives. And adjectives gives a noun a more specific meaning by answering questions such as what kind, which one, how many, how much. So let us teach them, well, of course, it's integrated approach. Let us teach them the structure of adjective and then apply it to writing descriptive composition, imagery. An image is a word or phrase that appeals to one or more senses. So this one is a must in descriptive composition, okay? For example, let's look at Ilech Amedi, the way he uses images to create a picture in the mind of the reader. From Ilech Amedi, the concubine on page 19, he said, he was describing the grave, the, 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 the husband's grave. He says, in the middle of the compound stood her husband's grave. The fresh red earth contrasted strongly with the surrounding, like a big red boil, Ichibute, on a black skin. Little gutters traced their way downwards from the top of the grave. Amadi has made us see and have the picture of the grave. The description has strongly appealed to the sense of sight. We are able to see the grave and its condition. 
let's very quickly look at another example from um, Aikwe Ama. The beautiful ones are not yet uh, born on page 12. Ama here was describing the staircase on those skyscraper buildings like Pindeko House in Osaka, you know, when where there are no leaves, people have to use the staircase with a barricade uh, made of wooden where people touch and lean against. So he was trying to describe that one. Apart from the wood itself, there were, of course, people themselves. Just so many hands and fingers bringing help to the wood in its course towards patrifaction. Left hand fingers in their careless journey from a hasty sliding all the way up the banister as their owner made the return trip from the lavatory downstairs to the office is above. Right hand fingers is still dripping of the afterpiece and is still sweat from fat crotches. The corrosed palms of messengers after they had blown their clogged noses, reaching for a convenient pace to leave the well-rubbed moistures. Afternoon hands, not entirely leaked clean of palm soap and remnants of kenke. The wood would always win. Wood would always win. Let's look at, look at the way Ama has used the adjectives, you know, in order to, um, to, to paint a graphic picture of the decay by us human beings when we are using those staircases, many hands, left hand fingers, careless journey, et cetera, et cetera. Here, when we look at Amaz's uh, text, the sense of sight, smell, and feeling are realized. We can see the movement of the hands. We can smell the pottery from the laboratory. We can feel the unpleasantness of the environment. So we use the adjectives in order to create the images. Equally, the use of figurative expressions. A few apt figures of speech will make your descriptive writing very powerful and lucid. Similes, metaphors, personification, onomatopoeia, etc. Let's look at the simile. It is a direct comparison between two things which are like or unlike in one respect, introduced by the word like or as. Let's remind our learners when we're teaching simile that it's not every time when you use the word like or as that makes it a simile. If you say Mary looks like her mother or Mary is like her mother, that doesn't make it a simile. Why? Because Mary indeed is like the mother. She has all the features that the mother has. Okay? She has all the features that the mother has. And after all, the, the, there's even that resemblance. So that doesn't make it a simile. A simile, if you say Mary is like a snake, Yes, that becomes a simile because you cannot compare human being. A snake does not have um, uh, a nose, two legs, you know. So that makes it a simile. Um, let's look at an example from Song of Lawino. Very quickly, from Song of Lawino, on page 38 by Ogot Piptek, the use of similes. My husband's tongue is bitter like the roots of the Liono lily. It is hot like the <clears throat> of the bee, like the sting of the calans, or cause tongues fierce like the arrow of the scorpion. Deadly like the spear of the buffalo hornet, it is ferocious like the poison of a barren woman and corrosive like the juice of the ground. Let's look at the metaphor. It is an implied comparison between two things which are alike in some respects. If you say she is a snake, that makes it a, a, a metaphor. He dwarfed everybody in the crowd. That is a metaphor. Personification, human characteristics are given, uh, um, um, 
sorry, human characteristics are attributed to something inanimate. The cold breeze whispered a few tru truths about nature in my ears. So when you look at the use of metaphors, the use of personification, the use of similes in a description, then indeed you are painting a picture in the mind of the reader. Sound, the use of sound in order to enhance the picture in the mind of the reader. Use written symbols, not sound. However, arrange the written words in such a way that they create a specific sound effect. Alliteration, the repetition of consonants at the beginning of two or more words in the same line. Called clear castle, the sound cut. Trust track to take you there, the sound tap. Assonance, the repetition of the vowel in two or more words close together. Percy took the paper paste to church on Thursday. The sound is cha. Onomatopoa. The sound of a word that imitates a well-known sound. Rather, the name of a word that imitates a well-known sound. Patapata. If somebody says, oh, the thief was wearing patapatas. You don't need to start asking. You know that the thief was wearing um, uh, shoes that were open and they were making that noise. Pata, pata, pata. Bang, popcorn. Let's look at a sample question. After we've taught all this and learners have understood them, they should be able to come up with very good descriptions. Let's look at a sample question. And the answer, describe a place that disgusted you. The answer, the disgusting house. The place actually seemed fairly clean judging from its surroundings. When the gates were opened, I could barely believe a human being could live there. One Monday morning, my mother told me to go and visit my uncle's house. I went at once, and by the time I reached his residential area, I was impressed by the general neatness of the neighborhood. I saw my uncle's gate open from a distance, and I ran towards it. When I entered the sight of dead cats and dogs, broken windows, and long and untidy grass completely changed the imagination of his neighborhood. If you, if you are frozen, living room, and what I saw grossed me out. I saw serious plates on the carpet near a television set, which had been vomited on. In the corner of the living room was a small pile of porridge like feces with the big greenhouse flies hovering over it. When I went to the bathroom, the situation seemed to be worse. Immediately I opened the door, a smell of gym socks and rotten eggs eased into my nostrils and almost made me pass out. Pieces of used tissue paper were scattered around the floor like an evenly water, watered grass in a field. As if I did not have enough of the nasty house, I wandered into the kitchen, which was not better than the living room or bathroom. There was what seemed to be leftover food in the sinks, as though the sinks were the replacements of the rubbish bins. 
being a place of food, it was very disgusting to see dirty underwear scattered around the kitchen floor like yellow leaves on a tree. The smell. The smell was unbelievable. And before I could look around even more, I quickly went to the main bedroom where I heard him snoring. When I entered the room, I had a struggled breathing because the room was warm and stuffy. The smell from the room was like that of a footballer who had a long and sweaty soccer match and took a long nap without first taking a shower. This was exactly the case in this situation because my uncle was sleeping on his bed whilst in his damp soccer kit while snoring and drawing. The draw even formed a pedal on the floor next to his bed. I did not even bother to wake him up. I just left him a letter of greeting and ran straight back home where I tried to forget the disgusting place, my uncle's house. That is recorded in the English composition uh, on page 33. Now, when we look at this composition, it's quite tight but very clear indeed. We can use this as teaching points to our learners. It has several merits. Firstly, it is well structured. Paragraphing is good, and the description flows the chronological order of the writer's activities as if it were a narrative composition. This way, the writer has managed to give a concise and reasonably comprehensive description of the place. Secondly, there is a variety of vocabulary, words and phrases such as grossed me out, drawing, pedal. You know, these add. These adjectives add to the painting of the picture. The writer's sensitivity to detail gives the composition convincing authenticity. Like the, the writer observes the sight of dead cats and dogs, serious split on the carpet TV which had been vomited on, a small pile of porridge like. Fourthly, there is a variety of sentences. They are simple, compound, and complex sentences which obviate monotony. So we teach them that when they are writing, they need to use all the four types of sentences, the simple, the compound, the complex, and the com uh, compound complex. Let's now look at, I'm trying to, to, to cruise so that we can have an interactive at the end uh, discussion. Discursive or persuasive writing. With discursive composition, it is also known as argumentative composition. And it actually it is proved to be a more difficult type of writing than descriptive and narrative. The writer usually arrives at a conclusion by reasoning. What should we focus on? The purpose is to convince or persuade the reader to accept or agree with the writer's uh, views. So persuasive writing expresses the writer's opinion and tries to make readers, excuse me, with it, change their own opinion and sometimes take an action. Many people have asked me, discursive composition, is it the same as argumentative composition? The type of composition there is discursive or persuasive. There are two, I must emphasize this point. There are two, okay? The under discursive, there are two. It's either it can be an argument where you only take one side of the discussion, uh, of the argument, you stick to it. Or it can be uh, a discussion where you review both sides of the argument and come up with a conclusion. So these two form what we call the discursive composition. So what should we focus on? Mainly, let's teach our learners 
to get their facts right. When they embark, they embark on uh, writing a discursive composition, let them get their facts right. Make certain that the facts are absolutely correct and valid. Let them plan their argument. Let them not present the facts haphazardly. Arrange the facts in a logical sequence. Those who are in debate will agree with me. Examine both sides of the argument. There are always two sides to an argument. If you choose one side, do not gather facts to support that side only and ignore the other side. So examining both sides of the argument enables one to produce a balanced argument and it gives the impression that you know the weakness of the opposition very, very well. The use of powerful and compelling de cohesive devices, this one is a must in uh, discursive composition, more so in an argument. The cohesive devices such as, phrases such as, it is my strong contention, it goes without saying, it is my conviction, I am convinced without any reasonable doubt. On the contrary, certainly, I strongly object that, definitely. It is obvious that there is no iota of doubt in me that when you speak like that, or rather when you write like that, then you are showing that indeed you are confident. Even if you are lying, people will agree with you. The use of pathos. Pathos, the quality in something that makes people feel pity. You know, you speak or you write so that people can get to your side, feel pity. A popular technique by orators and writers alike to connect with people on an emotional level, which is often far more moving than logic or reason. So this should be a topic on its own, the pathos. Let the learners come up with a number of um, uh, uh, pathos so that they can use it. So pathos is also sometimes akin to a fallacy when it's used only for the purpose of convincing an audience of something, of something even when there is no evidence to support that conclusion. At times, there can be an element of manipulation. When, when you use pathos, you know, there's an element of uh, manipulation. Pathos can be extremely powerful and in persuasive composition. For example, if a writer, a ch your child writes, if my allowance isn't increased, I won't be able to go, what is there? Um, if you don't move soon, we we'll all we are all going to die. Can't you see? how dangerous it would be to stay. That is pathos. Tone and style. When it comes to discursive composition, the tone should be, you know, you remain calm. Do not be emotional. So let's wrap it in, in our learners that, especially the girls, you know, they should not be emotional when, when dealing with a topic. Also the use of repetition, not an due repetition. Okay, it is rhetorical repetition because you want to rub it in. It is not money that makes a person happy. It is not money that wins a person genuine friends. It is not money that ends a person respect. What matters most is a good name. So you are not going to be penalized that you have repeated it is not money, it is not money. No, you are actually trying to convince or persuade the reader. The use of rhetorical questions, pastors, um, especially modern pastors are very good at using rhetorical questions. These are questions used to advance an argument without demanding an answer from the reader 
or listener. For example, under such circumstances, did you honestly expect us to go ahead with the conference? People would all say, no. What's the matter with the teachers of now? Our days. Let's look at the teaching of expository. The teaching, I must be very quick, and most people have asked me after reading the book, they say, but there seem to be, you've repeated the material. The teaching of uh, expository composition is not very different from discursive composition, persuasive. Expository writing is what you use to give directions, explain a new term or idea, compare one thing to another, or explain how to do something. Now, with expository composition, you are simply exposing the knowledge over something, something that you know. And with expository essays, if you don't know, that's it, you cannot respond to that question. You have to expose the knowledge over something. I always give an example of the computer. If somebody asked me, can you explain the internal components of a computer and how they coordinate and work? I know how to use the computer on the surface here. Inside there, I don't know. I'll end up calling a part a, a fuse. I'll end up calling a part a plug. I'll end up calling a part a, a mouse. I don't know. So I cannot answer such a question. That is expository, where you expose your knowledge over something. There are six main ways of writing an expository composition. Process explanation, cause and effect, comparison and contrast, definition, classification, problem and solution. What should we focus on? Like I said, not different from discursive. Get your facts right, except with this one, you are actually dealing with the knowledge. You know something. There's no room for imagination. Plan your exposition. When you are satisfied with the facts which you can substantiate fully and with confidence, rearrange the ideas depending on the nature of the topic as you see it fit. Use power of cohesive devices, like we said, uh, under uh, discursive, same with tone and style, just the same as discursive. A good expository essay is assertive and confident. Be consistent in your style. If you choose to be semi-formal, do not suddenly switch over to being very formal halfway through the essay. Let me conclude on the teaching of composition. I'm sure you are all familiar with my saying, equipped with the knowledge, coupled with a well-planned lesson, teaching composition will always leave you ever happy and smiling, smiling, and smiling. Let's move on. Host, do I move on to assessing? Yes, Chief. <coughs> Please carry on. Thank you. We move on to composition marking. You've taught, your learners have written. How do you mark? How do you assess? After every composition lesson, assess the learners by impression, error analysis, essay classification, and giving feedback. What is assessing by impression? An impression is a general or vague idea in which some confidence is placed. Okay? When I always give an example of myself, God created me naturally with red eyes. And I look as if I'm drunk all the time. I look as if I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, sick all the time those who see me for the very first time they if they drink they get very excited and they form an impression rightfully so rather wrongly so they 
with from their point of view, rightfully so, they form an impression to Akumanya Chakoro. We've met a drunkard. We are now going to, he's a very good man. We are going to drink. Okay? That's an impression. They formed that impression about me, and I don't blame them. Okay? So that's a general impression. This we attach even when it comes to composition marking. The first, the impression that you form out of a script, you know, that, that, that is very important. So when reading through a composition, form an impression. For instance, if Elena has opened with an eye catcher and it captures you all, the impression you form there, and as you even used the, all those things we were talking about, direct speech, you know, the use of telling and showing, you know, you, the impression you get is that this is a very good script. <laughs> so after you've, you've, you've gotten that impression, then you go in, into the real analysis of error analysis. They say looks are deceiving. The impression you get about someone, you'll be, be deceived. You think it's in color drinks, you'll be deceived. You, 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 you get shocked to discover that this man has never tasted alcohol in his life. You judge him from his eyes. You judge him from his talkativeness. And you, 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 you say, oh, this man. Okay? But then when you go into the actual sinkala, that's when you start adjusting. Okay? You start adjusting. Sometimes you even start getting disappointed. Oh, I thought this man drinks. He doesn't. Now, this principle, my friend, we use it. We apply it to essay uh, analysis. So you, you look at, a, uh, uh, I mean, after you formed an impression, you then assess the linguistic ability using error analysis by reckoning, indicating, okay, the errors by use of symbols. So whatever symbols you create, please avail them to the learners well in advance. Let them internalize them. Let them give them. It's part of feedback. So that when you indicate an error, a learner should not start asking, what is the meaning of this? So that should actually be, for me, it has worked well. That is the first thing. I give them all the, the, the symbols that I'll be using in my analysis so that they, 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 they are able to they are able to to internalize them indicate and correct all the errors underline all errors and ask pupils to correct them now there is a difference between marking during exams and marking uh, exercise books. Marking exercise books, the aim is to teach, to correct. Marking uh, uh, in the exams, you are not interested in correcting. You are simply trying to assess and allocate a grade, okay, to, to a candidate. So correct some errors and underline the others. In the exercise books, Select particular errors for indication or correction. Write nothing on the composition itself, but underneath it or in the margin, write extensive comments because the aim is for you to correct, is the aim is for you to teach, the aim is for you to assess that the, the learners have understood what you taught. These are some of the symbols. You can create your own as long as the learners understand them. SP, wrong spelling, T for tense, um, VF for wrong verb form, construction, pronoun, the correct sign where um, a word uh, is omitted, repetition, um, um, where material or vocabulary is repeated, punctuation, wrong way, uh, word order, wrong way. Now, I must explain, uh, most people get confused about spelling and wrong way. 
A spelling, by definition, is a word that does not exist in the dictionary, in the English uh, vocabulary, particularly in the um, dictionary. Any word that does not exist in the English dictionary, that is a spelling error. A wrong word is a word that exists except it is used wrongly. I thought I should clarify this one because most people mix the two. Okay. NP and para, new paragraph and paragraphing. Uh, again, these two are slightly, uh, they are different. Let's not confuse them. New paragraph is when a learner does not indent. By going by our syllabus in Zambia, it identifies only indentation, no block paragraphing. So it's only indentation. So if a, a, a learner does not indent and they just write in one, uh, one single, single paragraph from the first word to the last word, Okay, where you identify that they were supposed to split and begin a new paragraph, you put a line, um, uh, you put a line there and you indicate NP, you are showing that this is supposed to be a new paragraph. However, paragraphing has nothing to do with it, new paragraph. Paragraphing is when, for instance, Elena, uh, Elena mixes, uh, um, the block paragraphy, okay, uses the block paragraphing, skips a line in order to show the paragraphy. Or the learner, instead of indenting, begins a new paragraph quite okay, but without indenting, the discourse is the, the word is right on the margin. In suppose of in, without indenting, that you write para, not new paragraph, because it's already a new paragraph, except the learner has not indented. Wrong expression, irrelevant, the article, wrong article, construction, run on sentences. Now, it's not all long sentences that are run on. Run on sentences are only when ideas, there are so many ideas within one sentence, punctuated with a comma and the and. That one qualifies to be a run on sentence. Now, when you have indicated this, and. errors, after recording them, Mind you, you had already judged. You had already judged Sinkala as a drunkard. By the time you get close to him, you discover, oh my God, this guy is a Christian, a practicing Christian. The impression it changes. You've done the error analysis. That's what we do. Okay? That's what we do. So you've marked this script. The first impression, you, you got impressed because this this learner used the, an eye catcher in all, used the all, and then it, you say, this is a very good script. Then when you start the error analysis, you discover this, this learner does not know how to spell some words. This learner uses wrong words. This learner does not, you know, the impression already changes. You thought he was a good learner. No, it changes. So that change, okay? The, the, the composition is then classified according to classes A to D, okay? So the impression you form will qualify you to make it either A, B, C, or D. What are these classes? Class A, when you say this script is good, it is an A script, it should get 16 to 20. That's it. You've taken into account the impression marking as well as the error analysis. And you say, this is a good script. If it is a very good script, then it should score between 16 and 20. What is the composition of this good script? There must be positive linguistic ability, able to handle the language effectively. 
a variety of correct structures. Uh, sentences should vary, not just one sentence pattern. I always give an example of comparison. If a learner is just using the comparative, for instance, my mother is taller than my father. My brother is darker than myself. That, that's a comparative. That will give you an impression that this learner does not know that under the structure comparison, there are three ways in which you can compare things. You can use the comparative, you can use the superlative, you can use as as. So it gives you an impression, okay? A wide range of vocabulary, few errors which you can consider as slips. These are just, if this, if this learner used this word again, if it's a spelling error, for instance, you are convinced this learner would definitely get it right. That is a slip. Content, adequate, and relevant. These are the qualities of an script, clear and appropriate arrangement, adequate use of vocabulary and idioms. Let's look at B. B is 11 to 15. Fair ability with language, some variety of sentence structures, some errors, satisfactory treatment of subject, reasonable arrangement, some use of vocabulary and idioms. That constitutes a B script. So when you say this is a B script, you give it between 11 and 15. C script, six to 10. Flat to uncertain handling of language. Some structures, 40. Some structures, not all structures, but some structures, 40. Vocabulary and idiom limited. Not that it is not there, but it is just limited. A fair number of errors, subject not adequately dealt with, little clear development, arrangement poor or only fair. That is a C uh, essay which should attract six to 10. D script, zero to five, zero is a mark, zero to five. Errors must be frequent, sometimes multiple, broken English. In D minus, the subject is inadequately handled or completely misunderstood. Arrangement is muddled, difficult to follow. Development is erratic or non-existent. Such an essay is a D essay and can only score zero to five. So when you have classified an essay, a, B, C, D. Then you go to award a numerical mark, a numerical mark. So it's not by accident, it's not magical. You don't just mark and say, aha, uh -huh, oh, this one has failed nine out of 20. Mm -mm. There is a system, classification. You have said, okay, this is an A script. It's a very good script. But what type, according to these errors that I've discovered, what type of A is it? Is it an A plus, a high A? Then you give 19 or 20. No one will ever quarrels with you. Is it a medium A? You give it 18. Is it a lower uh, A, A minus? You give it 16 to 17. You are home and dry. The same goes for B, the same goes for C, the same goes for D. After you've done that marking, you've even awarded the mark justifiably, so you give feedback. And as indicated earlier, by indicating the errors that learners commit in their exercises, they will, they, they will attempt to correct them and henceforth cement their knowledge. Because you've indicated the SP, wrong way, whatever, they'll be, they'll attempt, don't rush into correcting. Yes, correct some of them, but the majority of them just indicate the errors and give them and tell them to rectify those errors. That way they will know that, oh, this is a wrong spelling. 
what is the wrong the correct spelling they'll go they'll be forced to find the correct spelling that is part of feedback the progress of individual pupils their ability in composition with other pupils in the class or school and the ability uh, relative the standards of public examinations will be known the references that we can use Rod Ellis and Brian Tomlinson teaching secondary English, a guide to teaching of English as a second language. We can also use Lazarus Sinkala, English composition and summary for school certificate. Thank you so much for your attentiveness. God bless you all. I'm Lazarus Sinkala. I'm open for interaction now. Thank you, host. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> And thank you everyone for your patience through our technical challenges. We can now go straight into questions and um, comments or contributions. You can um, raise your hand and the system will alert us. After that, you ask you to unmute yourself so that you can make your contribution. Any questions or contributions? If we have a challenge in finding the raise your hand feature, just unmute yourself and start talking. Okay, there's a hand. Miranda Mwang, I can go ahead. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Singala. It takes a lot of time to prepare, but the fact that he prepared, we are grateful and we've learned a lot. We are going to improve, especially in the area of assessment. Uh, half the time, like he said, we just guess to say, I'm going to give 10 marks, 12 marks. But personally, I've, I've learned uh, that there's a system, uh, a, discrete, a script, B script, C script, and D script. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Mwanga, for that. Doc, you have a hand up? Uh, uh, host. Chief, you want to no. respond? No, not really, but um, uh, those who are participating, it's better they tell us who they are and where they are from. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Doc. Hello. 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 Yes, Matinta. Yes. Um, I'm Matinta from Lusaka. Kamlanga Secondary School. Uh, I have a question on discursive composition. Um, yes. On where, where the children have to, where you have to write um, to or to write on both sides. Hello. Now, how do you do it? Yes. You write positive and negative, and then uh, you compare the two. Uh, I have a question on discussing. Uh, Mutinta, are you done with the question? Yes. Okay. Um, that is a discussion. With a discussion, you are discussing and you got to look at both. For example, uh, let me approach it from the point of view of a question. If, if a question came and said, a boy child is disadvantaged in Zambia, no, let me say, yeah, a girl, a boy child in terms of education opportunities is disadvantaged today. 
discuss that topic you know is very provocative you are not going to just take one side in discussing it you look at yes yes a boy child is um disadvantaged and bring out the points at the same time you are going to say no the boy child actually is not disadvantaged and bring out the points then make a conclusion it's only the conclusion that will show which side you seem to incline to but otherwise you are supposed to bring both sides yes yes spoken one tinta disadvantaged and bring out the points So I have understood that I have to talk on the positive and the negative and then conclude. Yeah. Clear now, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Doc, I had muted you earlier. Any other question or comment? I have a, I have a question as well. Maybe Sharon good evening. Theory? Yes. This is Sharon Theory. Yes, good evening, Sharon. From Shibuyungi District Nabundu. Wow. Yes, I just need clarification. Um up to now, I'm still not sure what the that paper for last year this uh, section b what it was others have continued to say it was supposed to be a speech expository i need to confirm with you and then the other question is on those questions that come as in not uh, discussive but where they ask you to argue for or against do we take the same structure for uh discussive where you do both parts or it's also supposed to have its own structure. Thank you. Okay, and Sharon, I'll begin with the second question. The second question, um, that one is an argument. With an argument, you only take one side, that's all. Okay. In the same Thank example you. that I gave, um, a boy child is disadvantaged in Zambia in terms of education opportunity. Do you agree or disagree? You only take one side. If you agree, you are going to bring points only to agree with this notion. If you disagree, you are going to <clears throat> you are going to bring out the disagreement points to disagree. However, if you read Lazarus Sinkara, Lazarus Sinkara says, but in doing that, you can use the opponent's uh, points in order to use them as ammunition to dilute them. That's why you hear people saying, they say a girl, okay? You say if in the same notion, a boy child is disadvantaged. And then um, you, 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 are, you are actually agreeing to say it is true, a boy child is disadvantaged. You can use some strong points from the other side. That's why you hear people using phrases like, they say women are the future leaders of the world without a woman, but the moment you say, but you are now shooting and you are diluting that point, which is an advantage to you. The, sec the first question, last year's paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Christian, I don't like lying, but let me lie, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't seen the question, uh, Sharon. What is the question? Let's not approach it from the angle of last year's. Let's just say a question like this one, how should it be approached? 
Okay, maybe I may not be able to remember exactly, but um, okay. it just required the candidate to write, it was saying write an explanation, but then what that explanation was supposed to be, others said no, it was supposed to be uh, a speech to take the structure of a speech. Oh, and others, okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Sharon. Like. Thank you very much. Now, uh, if it said explain, automatically it's an expository co um, composition. Now, you remember I talked about the four types of composition. The rest are topics. Let's not mix topics with the types. A topic can be written from any of the four types of composition. I'll give a very practical example. A letter, um, a letter, I mean, letter writing. That is a topic. If you are asked to write a letter to narrate what transpired when you visited your grandfather, that letter, it is a letter quite okay in terms of topic, but the type of composition is a narrative because you are narrating, you are giving a story. On the other hand, if you are asked to write a letter to explain how to how to use a computer. That is a letter quite okay. The topic is letter writing, but you are as, um, um, writing under the topic expository composition. If you are asked to write a letter to describe Lusaka, you, that is a letter, but that is the type is descriptive composition. If you are right, asked to write a letter to discuss the the, the the disadvantages a boy child, the, 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 the suffering a boy child goes through to get a place in secondary school in Zambia. That is a, dis, uh, a discursive. So let's not confuse the topics and the types. Now with regard to the question you have asked, it asked, you are saying it asked, explain something now, people, people didn't know whether it is a speech or a, an article or whatever. What is important there is that did they answer it as an expository? If yes, then they didn't go wrong. Okay? They didn't go wrong. The topic or the approach which they used, if they decided to approach that explanation, using an article, if they decided to use uh, that um, explanation using a letter, using a report, using that does not matter, except they may be caught wanting if, for instance, that type of explanation does not warrant you to write a letter. The impression, remember we talked about impression, okay? The impression will come in. Thank you. All right, Madam Sharon, is that okay? For instance, that type of explanation. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's have another question or comment. Samson James. Uh, thank you so much, Chief. I'd like to appreciate for the insight which has been given by Sinkara. Now, my question is here is a, um, I'm from Katete Day Secondary School in Eastern Province. Here is a, a student or a candidate who has written or answered one of the questions in the composition. But the question that this Chupu has written is not necessarily tackled, but has written slightly off the question. But the linguistic competence and everything is so good. How do we grade such a composition? Okay. Very good question. Um, Mr. Mr. Who? From Katete? Samson Perry, Katete Day Secondary School. Oh, you are the one who bought my book. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Mr. Katete, oh, Mr. Perry. Remember I said there is a difference between marking for exams and marking for classroom. Here in my presentation, my basis is on classroom, okay, where you want to correct. 
Now, to answer your question, in a classroom, because the aim is to teach, if and when a learner sidetracks, goes off, uh, off, uh, off track, mark it as normal and give it zero and tell that learner that he, much as you wrote so well, you did not answer according to the dictates. For example, if a, a question uh, says, write a story with a title, a snake in the grass, the one I've used in, in the book, a snake in the grass, and a pupil writes how very beautifully all the spellings correct, but is writing about the actual snake, how it attacked the whatever, and how it was running away, away from people when they wanted to kill it. You mark it, but give it zero and call that people because it's classroom we are dealing with. Give it zero, or maybe if you want to be lenient, give it five out of 20 and call that learner to give feedback to say, look, you, if you had answered this correctly, you could have gotten 20 out of 20, but you did not answer the question, so you got five or you got zero. That will pain the, le the learner, and that will be a learning point from the learner to say, oh, you need to pay attention to detail when he, uh, studying the question before you answer. Thank you. Miranda Mwanga, go ahead. Thank you very much. Miranda again from Kitwe. Uh, wanted to find out from Chief, when you are doing the error analysis, do you correct every line as long as there's a mistake? Uh, thank you, Miranda. Thank you. Uh, let's not mix the terms, correcting and reckoning. Yes, we are talking about recording. Now, correcting, like I said, correct some, leave the bulk of them for the pupil to try to correct them as a way of learning. But reckoning the errors, you just have to, to indicate you underline, you write SP, you underline, you write construction, you underline, that one you need to, so that the learner can go and sit down because they have internalized the, the, the symbols. They'll go and sit down, SP. Oh, so this is a wrong spelling. What is the correct spelling? That way they will be forced to teach and they will never repeat the mistake. Thank you. You underline, you write SP. You underline, you write construction. You underline that one you need to. Thank you, Chief. Any other question or comments? Any other question? Doc, welcome back. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, good evening. This is uh, Christopher Mpere from Nazibi. And I would, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Chief Sinkala for such a wonderful presentation. It's been done meticulously and is pregnant with uh, useful uh, information. Um, Chief, I would 
would wish also that you would also comment uh, the use of uh, particularly formal and informal as to where which discourse types in the formal language and how formal uh, language uh, that is official publicly uh, used uh, language can be employed alongside the informal uh, structures because this is in my uh, uh, experience with learners that they seem to use language indiscriminately, not uh, being able to distinguish between formal structures and the informal expressions and using them. So how can we help our learners uh, in terms of, uh, as we are presenting these discourse types, uh, and in terms of what kind of language necessarily to use and how and when they can um, interactively uh, the formal and informal language. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. How is Lundazi? Ah, we are fantastic. Okay. Uh, formal versus informal. First of all, uh, it's a pity. Um, I don't know how I can do this. I've recorded somewhere in the book that all academic writing, writing for examination purposes is uh, uh, academic uh, writing yeah, is a form of by nature. However, uh, there are certain facets. Uh, when we say, for instance, write a letter to your brother, narrating whatever, that's an informal letter, right? Now, being an informal letter does not necessarily mean you should go flat out using uh, informal expressions because this is an academic piece of writing. Okay. So as much as possible, let us stick to teaching our learners to use formal language, not street language. Not informal language. Okay. There are some informal expressions that, yes, can be acceptable because they are there and they are acknowledged in the dictionary. Okay. For instance, mom, that's informal, very informal. But if you are writing a letter to your friend, you can say, mom. But be careful and be mindful of the spelling. Because if you are going to say mom and you write M-O-M, that will be marked wrong. Because they are there and they are acknowledged in the chat. So, with regard to formal versus informal, for me, my stance is that let us realize that the you can say, academic work yeah, is a formal in terms of writing. Because if you are going to say mom and you write M O M, that would be much wrong. Does that do it for you, Mr. Mtale? So, for you to get to formal versus informal, for me, my chance is that let us Mr. Mtale seems to yes, be far from his yes. microphone. Oh, I, I am actually right here. I'd like to do it for you, Mr. Mtale. Yes, it does. It does. I can understand it very well. That's one area that has been gray uh, lately in terms of how uh, to guide the learners and how they actually employ the language. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, Thank uh, you, host, sorry. Hello, host. Oh, I, I Go oh, ahead, sorry. Just to yeah, just to cement Mr. Mtale's question, I've discovered it. If you read um, if you read uh, this book uh, um, by Lazaro Sinkala on page 94 it states very clear go and read it it, it explains very well better than i gave the explanation here can i read it please 
Okay. Um, if you look at page 94, those who have this book right now, it says, much as it is an informal letter, colloquial expressions and words should be avoided because the letter in a class exercise or examination is an academic piece of writing which is going to be examined and graded. End of quote. Very clear. <clears throat> Any other question or comment? Go ahead, Doc. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, our moderator, our host. I want to propose that we can end here for today and gather a lot of uh, you know areas that we feel the presenter can answer next time we meet. I propose that the next time we meet, we have maybe 10 minutes to answer to one or two things, which I have to read the differences that in my case, that uh, our presenter has given. I propose that for now, our host, we can uh, retire then give it 10 to 20 minutes in the next presentation so that we can ask categorically on the areas after we have exhaustively read also my submission. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc, for that submission. There's a hand from Mr. Sam Samuel, Samuel and Lovo. Please go ahead before we can close the meeting. Okay, Mr. Samuel Ndlovo has gone. I'd like to thank you first, Chief, for this uh, meticulous presentation. And I'd like to thank the audience for sticking with us. And we apologize for the technological hiccups that we faced along the presentation. But be sure to join us again next week for another exciting um, presentation on teaching spoken or spoken language in form of speaking and listening. Um, as Doc put it, we'll provide some time for people to ask questions if there are any. If you want, you can uh, put the questions in writing and send them to the email that send you, sent, sent you invitations. Thereafter, we can give Chief ample time to prepare for responses on that day before we can get into the new uh, presentation. So thank you. And please keep logging in. This program is here to help us during this difficult times of the pandemic to just get to interact and share knowledge and skill in our teaching to better our practice. Thank you so much once more and good night everyone.